astăzi despre Speaking on Story, familia. Domnul Nicolae Rație este președintele Fundației Calitatele Familia Rație. Please.
sold their birthright after a golden age in the fifth generation, then mounted a kind of rearguard action and couldn't hold on to what they lost. And eventually, the fifth generation sold the business out to uh, the uh, Japanese Nippon Glass Company. So the so Pilkinson still continues, but as a division of the of the, Pilkins, uh, the, the Nippon uh, Glass Company. The uh, first generation, which was William and Richard, I'll give you an example. He was so dedicated to the business uh, that he actually built an office bedroom in, in the works, uh, which is is considered I consider to be the first ingredient of a success in a family business is actually just straightforward, hard work. Hard work without any entrepreneurial spirit that will not, not create a successful company. In every business, you will invariably find the start, at the start, those two ingredients. But that's still no family business, it's always a one-man show. With Pilkington's, it became a family business when, when brother Richard came in, also taking shares. So one brother was out selling product, the other was back at the base managing, ordering raw materials, uh, paying the labor, and ensuring the quality. Now, William could trust Richard and vice versa. Trust within the family is there automatically. But sometimes, rarely, uh, it's proven unwarranted. But it's the vital reason behind the growth of family businesses, because you can, it's hard enough to trust anybody in business. You can, with a family business, at least you, 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 you think the chances are better than even that the, the, uh, the family members that you're working with. They may be incompetent, but they won't teach you. They won't, um, uh, they won't uh, deliberately go out of their way to destroy you or the business. A second crucial ingredient in this, <coughs> I'll come back to the part of the building story in that, is a clear designation of family member responsibilities. In other words, um, family members who were, who were in the business on the board uh, in executive positions, clear designation of what it is they actually are there for. Uh, a key <coughs> But that's old-fashioned explanation for the Pilkington success in succeeding generations was that it was an age when each brother, as it was, it was called initially Pilkington brothers, there were the two brothers, uh, is that each brother had six or seven children, out of which you can see that clearly there was a far better chance out of six or seven children that at least one or two would have some sense, some good sense and some, and some business brain. Whatever it, whatever it was in, whether it was sales, uh, <laughs> marketing, uh, uh, good, good figures, scientific research, labor relations, whatever it was. So the third rule, um, we've had hard work, trust. And the third rule is have a lot of children. But that does bring us to the next, uh, uh, the next problem. Children, obviously, and the, the, next, uh, the next question is, Succession. The Pilkingtons, uh, the problems that have been talked about earlier, earlier this morning uh, arose immediately. It, at the first, at the move from the first generation to the second generation. Uh, this was, uh, this was the, the story, and it goes in sort of the family history, is that uh, of the two brothers, William and Richard, William appointed his eldest son to the board without inviting Richard his partner brother's eldest son in as well. Even though the two brothers were equally functional in the, in the business. Uh, the, the, the wife of uh, Richard uh, at the time, a uh, very, very uh, strong lady apparently, um, made such a stink and fuss about this uh, and she didn't have a business card saying no, the wife, the wife of the bathroom. Uh, she, uh, she insisted that her husband wrote uh, a letter to the brother, the older brother, William, uh, to, um, uh, to instate their eldest son, uh, also to the board, uh, and gave reasons why, right, and, and uh, William actually immediately responded and appointed uh, Richard's brother uh, to an equal position. So, all the issues that, you know, that, that come up in, 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 in 
theory. Uh, you see repeated in a, in a family history that started back in the 1880s. Uh, so, so these are not new. These are not new problems. People today though, are far more aware of the potential problems surrounding handing over responsibility from the family generation to the next. But that certainly doesn't mean there are any easy solutions. Just as every human being is different, so will individual family company successions be uniquely different. Uh, but there are, however, some repeat phenomena. The founder generation finds it difficult to have confidence in the next, although the next considers itself more modern, better educated, trained, possibly holding uh, MBAs. But being the second generation, do they have the hunger that the first one did? Do they have an uh, entrepreneurial flair? Do they, do they have what it takes? I think the hardest thing of all for a son or daughter is to truly gain their parent, as in the founder of the business's uh, respect. You know, how, to, how to do that because they're just the son or the daughter. And, and this is where the, I think the, 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 the son or the daughter coming in must come in with some added value. Otherwise, they, they, there, is, there is little respect. And there is no ability to generate, if you like, the, the, the confidence in the parent, in the parent that, that the parent demands, as well as the son or daughter demands, in order to be, if you like, empowered to, 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 to do the business, to, to, to be successful in the business and the continuation of the business. There's, um, uh, there's a terminology which they, in, in family business, they call, they call the sticky baton, you know, the, the, the baton and the reel, which is a uh, sticky baton. It, it, the first generation, uh, they hand over responsibility, theoretically, the baton, but many, many times they retain uh, the, the true decision-making power and so on. And in fact, it's interesting, I was told the story by uh, the CEO of a, of a company a uh, big family company here in Romania, who was, uh, who was headhunted uh, to be the CEO of the family company. And he insisted that if he took on the job, uh, when he met the patron, and if he took on the job, that he had to have uh, authority uh, to, to act entirely without interference. So the patron said, yes, yes, that's why we're, that's why we're bringing in the uh, you as an independent CEO. And uh, so I said, yes, but you have to withdraw. Okay, I, I withdraw. Within three months, his eldest son was on the board. <laughs> so being, uh, moving on to the, uh, the burdens, if you like, of, 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 of family business. Uh, I, talk, I talked earlier about respect uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the, if you like, the uh, the, the need uh, to appreciate the the, um, the talents and the, and the abilities of the, of the next generation. Most people, there was a survey done uh, in the UK, most family uh, members uh, who enter the business feel that they have to work twice as hard to prove themselves. In the UK, they did a survey and they said apparently 88% of the second generation believe that they would have to work twice as hard uh, in order to prove themselves, not so much to their parents, but to their fellow co-workers, and to gain the respect of their fellow co-workers, because uh, he's just there because he's the son, or, or she's the daughter. Also, many family, many people who enter the family businesses, they feel uh, exploited uh, and underpaid right, from the father and mother's point of view. Why should I pay my son daughter a decent wage? You know, they're, uh, they're here. They're, they're, going to, they're going to be here anyway. In Romania, we're now, uh, I believe, <laughs> in what uh, Sergio was talking about, uh, at the handover stage of the of really first generation businesses. We don't have, um, there isn't the, you know, because of the 50 year hiatus, uh, and we went on further down the track. Um, so, therefore, the, the statistics available in Romania are virtually, virtually non existent. Uh, but to give you an example, in, in the UK, uh, the revenues of first generation uh, family businesses are, are calculated as being 540 billion pounds per annum and expected to rise by 
eighty to six hundred and sixty one billion pounds. And the family the value of family small and medium sized enterprises in the UK as a group is greater than the individual manufacturing business, wholesale business, or retail business and provides five and a half million jobs. Equivalent to the number of jobs in the British private sector. Uh, back to back to pilgrims. There is another saying which is uh, clogs to clogs. You know what a clog is? A clog is like a, wood, you know, a cheap wooden shoe. Uh, clogs to clogs in three generations. Comment on family businesses. Now you saw all the statistics by the third generation. I think it was what six percent was still successful. Or was it three? In uh, in the third generation, Pilkingtons almost went bankrupt until a non-family member was brought in uh, to take charge, uh, which caused huge uh, uh, ructions in the family and different branches of the family never spoke to the other ones for a generation or so. Uh, and uh, what happened is that the board. Uh, and the executive had become overpopulated by the Pilkingtons. And who were who were there simply because of their uh, because of their name? Their, um, they were they were a son, they were a cousin, they were uh, they were whatever it is, and uh, and the they assumed family birthright was the reason they were there, not not their talent. Uh, this was my. <coughs> This was my, uh, followed uh, by my mother's generation, which was the fourth generation. And by the time that generation came along, a lot of restrictions were put on the family. Like, for instance, that, that from each branch, only, they were only allowed to designate one member of the family to, uh, to, uh, to the board to come into the business. So that, so there was a, there was a competition, if you like, amongst the, amongst the families of that generation. Uh, to uh, you know, who, who should who could come in um, in in uh, my mother's generation it was my uncle David who, who then rose to become the uh, director uh, responsible for labour labour relations in fact it was his son uh, Martin who spoke at the uh, at uh, Maastricht uh, School of Business uh, late, uh, late last year um, and. Uh, so, the, as I said, the third generation uh, virtually lost it. The fourth, they brought in somebody else, an outsider, who, um, who they reorganized the, uh, the board. And in fact, the board that was, that was, that was created then, uh, one of the people who came in uh, was a Pilkington, uh, but a very, very distant uh, relation. And uh, it was he who actually delivered the gold in fact, the golden child, which was called float glass. Uh, very quickly, float glass was revolutionary. It's uh, and, and what it put it made buildings and success, and thereafter it became a public company and so forth. And float glass was the was the process of uh, instead of when you made sheets sheets of glass. In the previous stages, you had to you drew the glass up in the cylinder. And then you cut it and you rolled it, but you had to you had to polish both sides, which is a very expensive and energy-consuming uh, process. Float glass, which apparently Alistair built and uh, thought of thought up while he was doing the washing up. Another feature about the Pilkingtons was that they were always incredibly frugal. They never spent a penny on their uh, on, on, unnecessarily on uh, on uh, you know, privileges and. Maybacks and uh, Rolls Royces and all that. Um, but anyway, he said he was doing the washing up, and uh, he and he thought of the idea that uh, spotted on the sort of surface wall, surface tension. That in fact, if you rolled, if you if you floated the uh, the ribbon of molten glass out on another liquid, then the, the other liquid was had had a perfect surface. So therefore, the bottom of the glass would have a perfect surface, and since the liquid glass was also liquid, the top would have a perfect surface. So no more was needed any polishing, and 
this, um, you know, they spent a lot of money, in fact, as a family business, and talking about you know, planning for the long term, uh, the, the family, uh, that, that generation took no dividends out of the business. It went, every, any penny they made stayed in the business to develop this process. Uh, when it was developed, it was then, they then, they then exercised it and then sold the patents. For some, it was like 25 years, they sold the patents worldwide. So, the, so that is how glass is made, pet glass and window glass for, for cars and so on. That is how it's made, using that system, which is the, you know, the basis, if you like, of the, the, the fortune. Excuse me, please. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, just to set the hype finish, um, they, uh, the success could not be replicated in the fifth generation. The fifth generation ended up uh, selling the business to the, to the Japanese. And so there are no longer any public in the business, but it was a five year, five year generational history. And I think one that, um, there, there are books published on the, on the whole family history, which is very interesting because it goes into all the problems that we've been talking about, of generational change, of succession, of board problems, of the need for external directorships to come in and, and, and sort of So that is yeah, the perfect story. Thank you.